I'm excited for today. Let's make sure I'm live. Let's make sure my audio is right. Or uh, that usually takes a second. Let me double check my settings. Refresh the tab. Make sure you all can hear me. Okay. Hmm. It, can you all see my screen? I'm checking, and it looks like it's not going through. Me. I'll just reshare it again, just to avoid that. So in the UI I use, I can't uh, see the screen. Let me let me figure out how to fix this real quick. And now I'm not even getting the option for it. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, everyone. This happens once in every while. How's everyone doing today? Um, I'm just trying to make sure this is going through, which it's not. So that is. Mildly scary. Yeah, it's uh, the black screen is going through, which is concerning. So let's see what I can do here. Um, I'm trying to download the slides and upload them to Chrome now, my Chrome account. Give me a minute, everyone. Cool, I'm relaunching Jupyter Notebook now. Let's try this again. Uh, Conda Activate. I think it's called. Uh, no? Okay, this is scary now. <laughs> Give me one second, everyone. I'm trying to fix this. Aishman is saying pseudo RMRF solves everything. Yeah, most of the times it does. Um, Let's see what's going on today. I'll share my screen and I hope uh, the papers with code screen goes through. Is this visible to everyone? Conda activate coffee environment as always coffee is the solution. I tried that Dylan and I think that is what caused the issue. So uh, <laughs> awesome. Everyone can see my screens. Really sorry about that. Everyone. I use like very janky setup. My sometimes like my live streaming setups are worse than my Conda setups, believe it or not. And this is what ends up happening. So what I'm trying to do now is get the notebook here, which of course won't open because now's the time. Welcome back. We'll be talking about uh, the fifth chapter, which if I remember correctly is text generation. And then I'll be talking you all through how to efficiently read papers. So now let me bring the slides over here. I had everything set up, I swear, and it's just the, this thing won't show in Safari. So now we're good. Thanks for your patience, everyone. So this is the fourth part of the study group and you can find the links to the previous ones in the chat in the description right under the like button. Uh, you can go through those if you want. Uh, this is irrelevant to it. This is somewhat disconnected. You're welcome to watch the previous ones. If you haven't, it's all right. Uh, so this is the fourth in the series, as I said, and here are some questions we had tried to answer in the last week. And if you haven't already, I try to post these on communityh2.ai. So these are wonderful forums that you all should join if you haven't already. These were the questions we looked at. Why do we need positional embeddings? Why do we need contextualized embeddings? Why do we use NN dot embeddings from PyTorch? Why is it, why is it useful? What is a low, low resource language? For example, a language that doesn't have many examples on the internet uh, that you can train your models off of. So to recap, we paid attention to Transformers architecture. 
we looked at pytorch our implementation of the transformer architecture and we understood how to iteratively build on various ideas to get to the final architecture so we had uh, understood what the architecture is how it works and how do we get there that's what we did last week i spent some time iterating on it spent a lot of time rambling on it but i really hope everyone enjoyed that uh, walk through and you all were able to understand it so now for today's session i think what i'd like to focus on uh, today is spend some time on text generation so i'm guessing like 20 minutes and then go through the llama people a quick side note to everyone uh, i haven't slept i barely slept in two days but i didn't want to skip the live stream so i'm i'm just having enough chai to keep myself awake uh, i hope my energy won't be low i'll i'll make sure it won't be low so here's how text generation works in summary it is causal modding uh, and this is causal because in one of the previous live streams i had men mentioned this as casual and i was absolutely grilled in the chat so i'm making sure i'm right today normally what happens when you're trying to create any uh, form of transformer architecture is you take some input so people say the model uh, eats and spits out i don't like that terminology chat gpt 2 and bard i am on your side so this is for you i think you all are great and i think you are great robots and ai and whatever so i don't like to think that it spits out uh, outputs but i think it's a conveyor belt that's giving outputs that's how i think of it that's my mental model for it so when we are working with transformer architecture we look at the logics that are coming out and normally apply a soft max to the final output so that's our classification or regression we looked at this last week uh, if uh, you didn't watch those videos now you know but for text generation the difference is you need to continuously predict the next word and you're doing this sequential modeling of sorts where you're trying to predict the next word from this uh, model that you have trained for that there are different approaches in the book they talk about a few but you need to decode what the model is trying to tell you for that you could either do greedy uh based approaches which means just select the highest probable word that comes in the sequence i am just hand waving and talking about this we'll look at the code and i'll also like try to draw some stuff if my screen share works correctly so just just wait for a few minutes while i do that and then beam search is a slightly more uh, refined way it gives slightly better outputs we'll take a look at the notebook and how that performs and if you haven't already here's where you can uh find all the code to the book and even purchase the book if you haven't already transformersbook.com let me highlight that and we look at other ways of decoding so inside the chapter they teach you maybe you should use top k or when should you use nucleus based clustering and then we take a look at how gpt2 makes these predictions so this is what is covered inside the chapter and now let me copy over the tabs to this one i didn't mean to close this i meant to copy it from the other one so i had uh, another shout out to give to pastor this week he has been absolutely consistent with his write ups i had uh, i had myself sign up i was worried if it wouldn't show through but you can see that every week pastor has been constantly sharing his learnings in his uh, this write up he says i will explain the transformer architecture using the third chapter of the book and very well written in a post you can get a nice summary of uh, what he studied and to further if you have the time he's also written a nice notebook around it and this this made me very happy because uh in my opinion like i i honestly like making videos and what not but this is one of the best ways of learning and cementing these ideas in your head which i'll again bring up when we going through the paper so whenever uh you're trying to understand a concept i think it's absolutely amazing to write about it on the internet share it and that also attracts people uh, that are working on these concepts and that makes you visible to them i can speak about this for hours and hours but you can see that he's uh, used some nice visualizations his code is coming from the book so he's cre given credit to it as he should and this is an another great uh, notebook and write up as well so if you haven't already i'll i'll link these resources underneath but uh, make sure you find pastor on linkedin he's been sharing all of this stuff Hey Vadim great to see you in the chat 
so now let me make sure i copy over my jupiter token to this tab while i activate the correct environment i was able to activate the environment now let's make sure i can copy i know i'm not screen sharing right now because i don't want to expose my token and i think i have a port open so i don't want bots to log into my system i think this should work now yes it did so what i'll do now is i'll screen share again and this should go through no co coffee distraction no coffee distraction tara you can read about how to pretrain text generation model in my recent notebook vadim do you ever sleep he's always putting out notebooks and sharing a lot of stuff and on top of that he's also watching my live streams i think he has all the time <laughs> and some more in the world i don't know how he functions he does he just doesn't sleep this guy um so i'll try to go through this notebook now and explain some of the concepts here in this book as i mentioned earlier we look at gpt2 and when it had come out this paper had this story of a unicorn which uh, made it very famous and at that time many people started considering open ai with a unicorn emoji as well in their head because of that so the entire chapter or the notebook is based around hey can we like replicate that result and can we look at that and bring it back or how do we somewhat replicate that because the model is open source you can download it through hugging face so how do we do that now here they mention how uh, text generation works and they give some examples of how a chatbot can now make jokes this was just before gpt chat gpt came out so it's not mentioned in this book uh, but it's it's mentioned in the intro somewhere so that's because the book production usually happens before and then uh you can't change the chapters but you can only write an introduction but that's how there are no such examples and uh here's another showcase of how challenge of generating coherent text is so you have a step where you give the model some inputs these are the prompts or the words you give to the model and from there the model predicts the next word your challenge is to figure out how to predict the next predicted token not predict select because usually you have a collection of these and now there are different ways of decoding the model's output so the first one they mention is greedy search decoding and they simply first of all import the model which graciously fails here <laughs> so let me let me clear and run all cells I love Jupyter notebooks, but when it fails, it's it's mildly annoying. So we'll give it a second to go. I can hear my GPU spin up, so we should have the output now. I have a question: Why matrix multiplications are the way that? let the transformer predict i don't understand your question exactly so are you asking why do we use matrix multiplication to make predictions i think we have the outputs cool so what we've done here is uh, we've loaded in gpt2 excel and believe it or not when this paper had come out people were going crazy oh this is such a large model and now like this is this is a model you used to demo inside a notebook in under 2 minutes i my notebook had literally crashed and i didn't panic this time because i knew it would just run in just under that time anyway so we do the standard things just a quick refresher you always need a tokenizer you need to define the model you need to put it on the gpu sometimes you forget to put it on the gpu sometimes parts of your model on the cpu and then it complains hey one one tensor is on one device the other one is on other device what the hell are you doing so uh, you always need to make sure you instead of doing cpu maybe you all do this this is maybe only the only mistake i make or maybe a mistake just uh particular to me but i usually end up hard coding stuff like this 
and then in some places i forget it was cuda2 and i define it as cuda1 and the api does not like that not the api the uh, pytorch framework does not like that in fact it's just not possible to do that so always make sure you define the device and input it somewhere or if you're running a script which which is my preferred way nowadays uh, just make sure you take an argument for it and parse it so now we have the model and we use the auto model for causal not casual causal language modeling from pretrained we download this uh, model and then we use the input text transformers are the after that we pass this through tokenizers and we define the number of iteration the number of steps and the choices per step then we just run an inference with torch.nograd we run through the number of steps which in our case is 8 we define a dictionary to which we decode the tokenizer input we grab the output from the model select the logits of the first and first batch and the last token and then apply softmax to that we have discussed this in the previous live stream uh, just refresh through that if you uh, if you forgotten about this so we call torch.softmax after that we call torch.arg sort so i i am making a conscious decision today to not explain theory and just run through the code because i want to emphasize something today which is looking at the docs uh, is more helpful than looking at the theory most of the times so if you're working in nlp looking at the transformers doc which are absolutely pristine high quality will give you more returns than looking at the theory although like there are fine times when you should do one or the other most of the times if you're running through this and if you forget what arg sort is or if you forget what you're doing just press uh, shift double tap which i hope the pop up is showing up let me make sure that is showing up it is cool and then just read through this if you have more time go to the page read through the examples there and then maybe go to uh, reading about the theory so this returns the indices that sort a tensor along a given dimension in ascending order by value so we are basically getting probabilities and trying to sort them store the tokens with the highest probabilities the model here would output theory is less than code go bar uh yes it is i have i have some stable diffusion analogy uh for that if you are curious dilan i can i had those tabs open but i'll come back to them if i if it's of interest so uh the model is always giving these outputs and these are usually matrices or tensors and you would ideally like to work with those probabilities this could be logits for this case we are storing the tokens and we sorting them with the highest probabilities why because we have a sequence of words and we want to predict the next most probable word so given this prompt what is the next most probable word so we are starting simple here this is the greedy search decoding we look at other formats as well and we'll also see why this is not the best so here we're doing the lazy way or the greedy way which is if you've been greedy you won't work hard and you'll just take the easiest path out the easiest path out here is what's the most probable word just give me that i'll output that so we collect all of these we decode them using the tokenizer and then print the outputs and we basically showcase five such choices over different prompts along with the probabilities or the percentages transformers are the most popular toy line in the world united history usu that doesn't make any sense transformers are the most popular powerful common famous successful that doesn't make any sense either right so you can see that this approach uh, is in the best Uh, even though we are using a pre-trained model it should be able to work with it uh, it usually is not a good idea to always rely on greedy search although i will mention this if you are working on a kaggle competition i have multiple of these models it's always a good uh, idea to ensemble or use predictions from different models so you might want to uh, explore there but for this case you can see that it's not really coherent 
Uh, no, the live stream isn't dependent on the first fifteen minutes. We are going through the implementation, the notebook of text generation, and then we look at the Llama paper. So after this, we throw in another input, and this time we look at the greedy output through model dot generate. and here's the output we are getting so what they've done here is they've shown how to do this with raw code and this is a approach they follow throughout the book right they show you something in concept how you write the code for that and then they abstract away the details using the transformers api and that's why it makes this book really great because you also see how you would implement it yourself and then you have that mental building block of how it would happen inside the transformers api so my way of learning through this uh, notebooks or these books is i would read the code i would run it and then i'd always try to close it and rewrite it so maybe this acts as a refresher for you all i would just suggest that if you're trying to do this what my favorite uh, idea to do, replicate this is uh, i will write a comment here generate text through transformers API. And now I, I would like delete the cell or I would just write a notebook without these prompts. And then I would come back to this two days later. By that time, I would have forgotten that you can call model.generate. So that would take me to Hugging Face Talks. And there I will try to look up how do I do such things. And this, I think, and many people agree, cements the idea. Uh, in your head, or cements different concepts in your head. Surya is saying he's dropped me a message. I will check it out, Surya, right after this live stream. Thanks for that. Anyway, side tip for making sure you learn faster. Next, we look at Beam search decoding. So uh, there are different ways alongside it. If you read up the theory, I might piss off a lot of people by using my next definition. But I try to think of it as like a analogous to tree-based structures. So you have these beams going through each other. And this approach basically relies on constructing this and going through this list. So you can see that transformers will be released in theaters. And you can see the other option is transformers are the most popular toys. So this is another way to decode your model's output. And here the authors talk about you should run the logit output through a log function. Why is that? Because they print out the values and show that these can be really large values. So for that, you need to normalize these and also run them through logs. And they prove it in the theory that this makes your life easier as a programmer and also as an ML engineer because it's easier to work with log functions and it's easier to normalize all of this. You can read through the book's text. It takes for, if 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 you're not like a very math heavy or if you don't immediately come up with mathy concepts, which I don't, it will make, uh, it will take time to make sense. So for me, I always struggle with such bits. That's why I'm 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 saying this not to embarrass myself, which I have already done many times, but just to point out that these things take time. Beam forming looks like a random forest. Yeah, that's that's how I remember it, but uh, I I've, I've forgotten the exact theoretical definition of it. Uh, so I'm worried if it'll piss many people off if I just call this like a tree-based structure. <laughs> so you can see that here's a way of uh, grabbing the. Sequential log, uh, sequential log probability. So you send in the model and you grab the, you pass in the output greedy. And from there, you send in the input length. And now you're printing the statement based on the log probability. So you compare the greedy way against the beam way. So this time you say output beam and you compare the log probabilities between them. Higher is better. So you can see that beam is slightly better in this case. Another way of making sure that uh, your outputs are better. They talk about this a lot in the book. 
so if you actually read through this text which is what i was trying to do right now so that's why i was taking pauses you'll see that these are somewhat repetitive or maybe not the best examples so one way to improve that is you can say that don't repeat n grams and you say uh, size 2 this improves the output slightly but uh, that makes the log probability worse for this example so you will have to experiment and see what uh, different parameters work best for the outputs and this can also be very subjective right although there are ways to evaluating this next they talk about sampling methods and how you can generate output so they talk about temperature and there's a nice definition inside the book around this which i'm going to completely ruin by saying this here's my analogy to remembering this uh, i'm boiling chai and as the temperature goes up there's a there's a limit until which the milk uh, doesn't go sour so if you raise the temperature beyond that the milk will go sour and the outputs will stop making sense and that temperature is 1 in this case so above 1 the model tends to be more creative but the output is like useless most of the times so you would want to have your temperature under 1 and you can this is in homework task for everyone you should experiment with it but try playing around with the temperature and see how the outputs come out so here's an example of output temperature decoded through the tokenizer and uh, today or you'll see me through the weeks uh, glance over a lot of stuff because last week if you attended and i was worried while streaming because i was painfully slow when po pointing out hey tokenizer convert a thing into a number and this is how they work now i'm going to glance over this because we've looked at many times and i don't want to waste your time uh, i think everyone is here to just get a summary so if i'm glancing over a lot of things it's by design but if you don't get anything or if i make a mistake please interrupt me because sometimes i glance over a few topics so here we are using the temperature to and let's read through this uh decoded output in a shocking finding scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote previously unexplored valley in the these mountains i don't know where these are even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that unicorns spoke perfect english so you can see that two is okay but if you go above that you can see that the output sort of gets ruined and un under one you'll see that the model is less creative and it will form outputs that are somewhat similar to its uh, training data set and still they they would tend to make a little more sense after this they talk about top k and nuclear sampling so i had come up with a really nice way of explaining this to everyone uh, but instead i decided i will again point everyone to using the documentation so if you ever get confused about what is top k and what is nuclear sampling i would suggest just go to hugging face and see the different options that are there inside uh, what are we looking at language modeling outputs so you would probably be looking at the different functions around it and the api to grab the outputs i think the text there is a better way of understanding these concepts so you can take a nice look at what top k is and inside the book they come up with these mathematical notations which i understand more now because we've done that reading group on the book but uh, i again there is this always uh, if as you many of you would know what these techniques are and how you sample all of this but if you don't uh, your time is sacred right and you can spend that either uh, reading up the theory or coming up with solutions that you can work for or showcase to different people uh, because you all just like demos right <laughs> dilan says it seems about as coherent as his writing i'd say it's better than my writing though you should see my writing so here they've plotted uh, the probability distributions and inside the book they talk about uh, thresholding and using the top k threshold versus using nucleus threshold how these both uh, differentiate i found this to be straightforward and it was like a simple explanation so i'll skip this and we can come back to this next week if uh, it's not clear to everyone because i really want to focus on uh, the llama paper today 
so i'll take a few sips of water and now we'll look at the lama paper and i'll talk through how i like to read papers in the mean few seconds dilan uh, i promised you to showcase my stable diffusion outputs so here are the ones i wanted to bring up so i had come up with this by running it through the control net model i ran the beautiful pytorch logo logo through a custom model and just enabled the canny edge control net model through it pretty much used the default options and this is what it came up with this was just some cool prompts that me and my good friend nishchay came up with no i don't want notification i just want to look at this and i was really happy because uh, this caught andre karpathy's attention although he still hasn't agreed to my interview which i'll keep keep asking him to uh maybe one day we'll convince him or maybe one day i'll get blocked uh, both of these one of these out outputs i'm not okay with but this caught uh, andre karpathy's attention as well so i was really happy to see that then after that i basically spent the entire week cooking up some more uh cool outputs so here's one of them is this visible to everyone i'm just always worried about that now so this is a city of i put in the prompt h2 ai uh, robots something like that because if if you've looked at the logo of the company it's yellow and it's it has these blocks i was trying to come up with something like that to make my coworkers happy and these are one of those slide decks we use so i thought maybe let's do something cool with it and i basically it's h2 so it's water and uh, it's yellow so i came up with an underwater city by using control net sorry about that uh, i wanted to hydrate myself and now we'll take a look at the llama paper which is what everyone is here for if you are interested in this i don't know how the interest of uh, the chai time community is for this i want to showcase how to use diffusers and come up with like a short live stream for it maybe even do some live coding around building a few things around it i have some ideas but i don't know how the interest is so let me know if you watch that if you're even mildly interested in it if you like these outputs because i'm i'm personally like really really wasting a lot of time doing all of this nonsense and it'll be fun to this uh, showcase it to everyone so now i'm mildly pissed because i think uh browser history is a really good thing and i don't mean to make any jokes here about the standard internet memes but i'll talk about i've been studying a lot about neurology and uh, understanding and retaining things so i like to have safari logged in everywhere i use an iphone my macbook is logged into the same account at that sinks the history that is important to me uh, because i always forget some ideas and then if you do this you can just look up different words so let's say this would show up uh, in my safari browser which for some reason the screen share wasn't going through but if i would have looked this up the second or third link would have been of the documentation which i would have visited apple is really good with this and the reason i point this out is uh, whenever you working with papers you're always looking up different concepts when you're trying to understand papers so it's it's a good idea to have this working memory we all have this working memory where we can retain ideas and we have this long term memory i think this first of all supplements that so to read any paper what i do first of all is i find those papers how do i do that i go to papers with code or i go to twitter i follow a lot of incredible people ak is one of my favorites because he sends one paper every hour and then you have the form of your life but realistically speaking i go to papers with code and i take a look at trending research now if you do that every morning every day you will be completely overwhelmed right so how do you pick these papers for that this is the zero it pass as i would call it now i as i mentioned i'm interested in stable diffusion these days so i'll probably hunt for stable diffusion papers i personally don't look at uh, where the research papers coming from so is it from let's say 
गूगल रिसर्च और मेटा रिसर्च आई रिस्पेक्ट ऑल रिसर्च आई डोंट अंडरस्टैंड दाइन डिफरेंसेज सो फॉर मी आई आई लुक एट ऑल दी पेपर विद इक्वलाइज आई डोंट डिफरेंशिएट बिटवीन दैट मैन आई स्टार्ट स्क्रोलिंग थ्रू हेयर सो आई सी Lama, which we want to read today, and it says "Open and Efficient Foundation Language Models." So that title catches my attention, and then I read through this. We read, uh, we introduce Lama collection of foundation language models, ranging from seven billion to sixty-five billion parameters. Looks interesting, and it has a rise, a very nice rank on question answering. So maybe we'll open that in a tab. and then we can see the different benchmarks it's performing across if these look legit enough i'll keep this tab open otherwise i'll close this tab here and i won't read the paper if it has a code repo i'll go to a code repo and see if it's actually full of code or if it says coming soon because most of the times uh, the soon never comes and i like models that you can run if they take you to the hugging face model hub i would just clone it poke around if i can but now back to scrolling through this so what you there is there is like different discussions around it if you have a certain interest you want to explore all the papers around it if you have a uh, divergent interest you probably want to keep up on all of it i really don't care if i like a paper i'll read it i'll try to understand it i suggest the same it's up to you what you do uh, i'm just sharing my analogy and i'll probably spend a good portion Let's say I spend like fifteen minutes to half an hour every day just scrolling through this, keeping up with papers. And another good signal is if you're following all of the people on Twitter. Like I mentioned, these papers would constantly resurface. So if you open Twitter every now and then, you would see the paper in the like first five tweets. Twitter is really good at that for staying on top of research. If that keeps happening, so if the people I really respect or the people I really enjoy if their tweets keep coming up about something, I would definitely download that paper. So Lama is one of those that I wanted to read and I thought let's let's do that live today. So now what I'll do is I'll download this paper. It usually takes a second. and i wanted to annotate it while we went about it but i won't be able to because the screen share isn't working properly i'll talk through how i read to this, through this paper this is just a suggestion it's totally up to you i really like to make notes while i'm reading and i've read a bit about this but when you're just reading it's just your eyes being engaged so i've read a bit about this if you have another sense engaged where you're writing because that engages more parts of your brain and then you since you're writing you sort of get more involved it's helpful to focus and retain things so for that reason i'm not just making this up i have a remarkable with this pen which makes it really nice to read the papers you don't need this you can just download them print them out read them on paper as well but i would highly suggest making notes while you read a paper if you like thoroughly read it so this is like if you want to go full in understand the paper properly don't just read it you will forget it and you want to make sure you retain some of the concepts so that you can try to implement them later on so have have a pen and paper handy make some notes just scribble something if you can and write the minimal points if you want i write i like to write extensive questions and prompts prompts pun intended so that i can think about it and then later when i have the time i put them in a like a digital folder so that also syncs across my devices and that keeps changing so for a while it was notion uh, nowadays it's just apple notes which also i had open but i won't be able to screen share it looks like and i'll have to spend time debugging that so since i made up my mind to read through this paper i would be taking notes but that's for later if this is a paper that has caught my intention and i'm still judging if i want to spend time on it so what you want to do is you want to look at multiple papers in a day and then probably read one and i'll i'll give a spoiler this is one of the homeworks i have suggested as well read five papers but understand one and that at least i felt like that was a very clever suggestion that i came up with because it's easy to read five even 10 papers but it's hard to really really understand one and there are different levels to it of course 
so at this stage i'm interested in this paper i've downloaded it which means i'm interested uh, my downloads folder is always full of papers with these different ids and you can never search them so if you download them the first thing you should do is rename it so that you can search it that's another pro tip there and now i'll read at, read through the abstract we introduced llama a collection of foundation language models ranging from a large number of parameters so i see this i would uh, highlight this and write large language model here we train our model on trillions of token i would highlight this as well and show that it is possible to train sota model using publicly available data sets exclusively without getting access to proprietary or inaccessible data in particular this is llama 13 so that means it's one of the smaller models outperforms gpt3 on most benchmarks and they say llama 65b is competitive with best models okay so this this looks promising enough this looks interesting enough if i'm interested in understanding how this works or their training methodology i would read, read along now i would just skim through different parts so i would check out the approach and i'm what i'm doing here is i'm looking at the titles so inside their approach i can learn about their pre training data set which they told me already right so they said it's public data so that doesn't catch my attention right now and i can see different highlights which says english common crawl c4 github archive these looks like the names of the data set to me and we can see the tokenizer so they give some details about how do they are tokenizing the data this catches my attention and i read through this we tokenize the data with byte pair encoding okay so i make a mental note and i'll highlight this saying okay byte pair encoding with large language models i'll put a question mark there and maybe even take a note because i'll come back to this or i'll look at other papers uh with large language models and see if they are using byte pair encoding because then i want to remember that with large language models maybe this is the trick or when is byte pair encoding being used do you run the code with different data sets not during the skimming stage so you want to when you're doing this you want to read five papers and understand one for understanding that one you should be running the code but that's like that's much later i'm so i'm going through the stages of how i read the paper at first i showed you i just like read through the papers with code now i'm skimming through it and then i'll point out how you like do a fine uh, pass through it so i see tokenizer this catches my attention okay i'll highlight this move on i see a table so it's always good to look at the tables if it has the results i don't pay much attention and this is this is a hot take many many researchers like to look at this i'm not a researcher i'm remotely not as smart enough and i don't intend to beat any benchmarks maybe a kaggle kaggle leader would some day but not not any research benchmark so i always skim past that because that's not of interest and i don't understand or remember the benchmark key data sets but this one talks about the tokens so i will look at it it talks about the parameters the dimension number of heads layers learning rate batch size and number of tokens so you can see the batch size is pretty insane 4 million right when did the last time when was the last time you saw such a large batch size i don't remember when um you can see the dimensions so you can see that these are also pretty large which means they would have trained this model on a large compute cluster but it's cool to see that okay these are the batch size they use there's no special learning rate uh maybe it was like 3 to the power 3e e plus 2 then i would have gone crazy and i would have dug into why that is but it looks like okay these are just details about the model size in an architecture nothing stands out so now i'll skim through the architecture i see they talk about pre normalization the activation function uh, rotary em rotary embedding sorry i don't even know what that is that's why i got confused so maybe i'll come back to it i see efficient implementation so i hope they have written about it and then we can take a look at the main results so i see zero shot and few shot highlighted there so what i'm doing so far is if i just go through it uh, sitraka is saying the, the batch size is crazy i agree with you 
but i'm just looking at headings and trying to gauge if i like want to spend an hour of my day understanding this paper so far it's been like interesting enough right so if i had seen more than five math heavy theorems by now i would have not read this paper because that means uh, it's more theory heavy and i probably want to spend my time elsewhere nothing against that maybe you want to read it if so please go for it this are this is like very opinionated way of going through papers <laughs> 4 million tokens is into large just need 2 2800s just 2800s so i see a natural question uh, performance data set and as i mentioned earlier i don't know what this data set is so i'm sure you can look it up i'm sure you'll get a lot of papers alongside it uh, these words don't make any sense to me so i'll skim past and i see some mathematical reasoning i see code generation capabilities so so far it's caught my attention there are different factors that made me decide to read it so i saw that there were some some details about implementation there were some nice uh, explanations of why they use different concepts and then uh, this paper has always shown up on twitter and it's been really hot in the field if you looked at twitter it was always on top for different reasons as well and uh, it's also on top of papers with code so this is a nice candidate for spending time so now i'll scroll down to the last part which is uh, usually conclusion and we can see here in this paper we presented a series of language models competitive with sota foundational models most notably llama 13b outperforms gpt3 so it looks like this is the new sota at least that's what they claim unlike previous studies we show that it is possible to achieve sota performance by using publicly available data sets and they say they are releasing these model weights to improve their robustness finally we plan to release large larger models trained on larger pre training corpora in the future since we have seen a constant improvement so i have understood this paper will teach me how to look at uh, larger models someone is asking what's the channel about we are reading a paper and we go through different machine learning stuff uh, welcome to the stream by the way so it will teach me about large language models it will give me some tricks about how this model will train and that is what i will get out of it i'll get some implementation details they have open source their code so you could probably also dig through that and usually this is one one place where i'm a bit conflicted so if the model is on uh, hugging face hub or if it's coming out of google ai meta ai uh, nice companies research labs their code is usually well written most of the times most of the times so you would also enjoy reading through it so that's also a nice place to like dig through and understand how different people uh, spend their time or not spend their time how different people think about different concepts and how they code this so sometimes you can learn different tricks through it now i'll scroll past it sometimes you have cool stuff in the paper uh, footnotes so you can see that here is a question on ans question answering detail we evaluated llama on these these data sets uh, there are some outputs looks cool not not uh, of high interest to me so i'm scrolling past now if you were when would this be of interest if i'm working on a kaggle competition or a problem involving question answering then i would be completely drooling over this part and trying to see how this model is performing because then i would have nice attention and then this topic is of interest to me right now uh, okay it's cool to see question answering uh, not really curious uh, like not really a like curious topic to me so i'm scrolling past this looks interesting generation from llama 65b because we were looking at uh, text generation today right so like we can look at this it gives in these numbers and you can see the outputs here so there are some cool outputs you can see that it's also able to generate code i'm trying to read through it if it makes sense does it i think it does 
find real loots i'm trying to recall if this is the way you know what uh, what would have been cool if if my browser would log was logged in and if this was the right browser i would have asked chat gpt the same question and compared the outputs <laughs> and we could have looked at both the outputs and seen how they compare that's like a cool cool way of comparing it right here's a prompt about yan le kun's rap album which is cool to see so uh, i would probably read this more than i would read the paper and this by this time the paper has caught my interest so now i decide to read through it properly which means i'll go back up and i'll read again let me catch up with the chart for a second do we have some literature around how to train for improving chain of thought prompting what can be done in a training setting to improve chain of thought i haven't come across such a resource i'm sure there are a few but i haven't does super glue benchmark determine whether model is sota there are different benchmarks right and models are sota across different benchmarks so i'm not sure uh, if super glue is the go to one that's only for a 2 by 2 matrix i think dilan was talking about the code output yeah i don't remember it's been a long time since i've calculated real roots so i need to i need i don't want to but i might need to look at it what are your thoughts on using llama in multimodal problems it's a text based interface right why would you want to use it in multimodal problems and by the way this is one of the ideas i had for a future live stream coding live stream where i would use the chat gpt api come up with prompts uh, make a small demo app where i would feed that into stable diffusion and see how that goes so i'll probably like ask chat gpt the meaning of life it would say it's a chatbot and it can't say Uh, or i'll i'll come up with something creative feed that into stable diffusion and like come up with this weird galaxy brain idea and see how that goes these are the weird ideas i've been thinking of uh, if they sound too weird i haven't i haven't been sleeping as i said earlier but if you want to watch them let me know because i i'm really keen on doing that and I, i've really been enjoying like exploring stable diffusion for that matter like doing a chart on image context multimodal thing yeah i mean uh, it it's all experimental right probably i probably wouldn't use llama for it because it's a large language model unless like it's it's available as a free api for free inference this model is quite expensive to infer on where llama lies on the transformer tree of life um I think I don't want to be wrong about this pastor so I'll I'll come back to it next week. They say it's better than GPT-3 but I don't know how well that's been tested. But it would it would fall as the successor or like the better model after GPT. We'll have to see that though. So now I'm at my third pass the first pass was where i just came through social media and papers with code the second part pass was where i like looked at the topics and gauge my interest now i'm interested so i'll read it sincerely so i have read the abstract i know what it is i'll read the introduction large language models they'll probably talk about large language models note that i'm still not reading every single word so i'm still conserving my time because i want to explore more papers or maybe have more papers that i can go through so i'm skipping paragraphs that i might not like they say the objective of scaling laws is to determine how to best scale the data set and model times however this object disregards the inference budget which becomes critical when serving a large language model at scale so now now i'll read this paragraph because i why did i decide that i saw inference budget in italics so that means like this is of interest because i am curious how you serve these models in this context given a target level performance is not the fastest to train but the fastest at inference and although it may be cheaper to train a large model 
to reach a certain level of performance a smaller one will ultimately be cheaper so for that reason they come up with different models the focus of their work is to train a series of models that achieves the best performance at various budgets so this means this paper is going to talk about how to uh, efficiently run inference for different models and now i have decided at this point to fully invest myself in this paper so this is the understanding phase and this is the final phase now there are like always these like uh, points where you can gauge your interest you can always come back to a paper later as well right if it doesn't resonate with you or unless it's like a really ground breaking paper then you have to like really force yourself to read through it which is somewhat true to this case many a times you're always like trying to skim through papers some papers have like a cool title and they're like hard to understand so i was talking about these steps that help me understand if like it's a paper that i would want to read properly so you're always trying to get to the stage of fully understanding a paper but also being careful if you want to understand that paper and if it's worth your time if you look at uh papers with code once again and if you go to the social tab you can spend your entire day just refreshing this and uh or the new tab and you can see things move up and down so fast you'll, you'll, you'll just be so confused so there are like ways of staying hyper on top of research i want to like just understand the key new concepts so for that like i look at the papers and then make decisions after all these processes if you want to share with the community papers like ak who i think is a chatbot and who i think was uh chat gpt released to hugging face because he works at hugging face before they released it to the world you can do that but these are the steps i follow glin says even if llama is in strictly better it's one third the size which is crazy exactly exactly so just looking at all of those facts it makes sense right sometimes papers would make some claims in the introduction and then you read through it and then you realize that's really not true so for example they might say oh 65 billion is the best model and then somewhere they would say our 500 billion model parameter uh, based sorry 500 billion parameter based model outperforms gpt3 which isn't cool right but here these were the boxes checks so it's like a really cool paper makes sense i would read this which i am doing right now and i'm pointing out how i go about that so at this point i'm paying full attention to almost all of the words and uh, going through this i would still probably make multiple passes so that's why i might skim a few things just to have an understanding of how the paper is structured the focus is to train a series of language models that achieve best performance at various budgets llama ranges from 75 billion to to 65 billion parameters with competitive performance now this is a point where i would look at the performance and if i want to select one of these models i would go to the benchmarks right once i find them and now i would look at how llama compares against these models right so let's say let's say i want to comp- uh, pick one that's better than gpt3 for uh, piqa uh, benchmark i don't know that is i'm just i'm just making this up so i would look at the different model performances this is worse uh, this is somewhat close this is better and then i would look at is this like a cheaper thing to infer compared to the other model and then you would probably talk to your team about like testing it and having it integrated into a product or something like that right and even before that you would probably test it so to see how good it is maybe it's just good on this benchmark and it's like not as effective so at this point you would like this is how you would uh, pick which model you want to work with and that is when you actually look at the benchmarks so here they say llama 13b outperforms gpt3 on most benchmarks despite being 10x smaller like dillon also pointed out and they say uh, this will help democratize access of large language models since it can be run on a single gpu this is uh, not exactly true because when you think of a single gpu most people think of a gaming graphic card 
uh, unless you have the highest end which is like a 4090 or a 3090 this might be tricky and you have to like use a lot of tricks although and you have to really dig to find this if you go to the repository in one of the issues someone has shown how to use the smallest model on a cpu that will take a long time so when you are putting these models out you have to also think about what service is it being used at and how long can the person wait so if you just want to like generate some stuff that's like really not relevant or really not like immediately required you really don't care how long it takes right as long as it's cheap so if the cpu inference is cheaper than gpu it would go that way but if you want like a real time interface so let's say you like trying to recreate open uh, chat gpt through open assistant and you want to have this nice live interface there you would probably want a faster response now you would also look at tricks how to serve it faster probably have it compiled with uh, torch 2.0 maybe you'd probably have it jitted probably have a onyx uh, pipeline because all of these tricks make it faster to serve i am again going on a tangent i'll come back to the paper now in the rest of this paper we present an overview of the modifications we made to the transformer architecture as well as our training method then we report the performance so this is great because i know they took the transformer architecture and they modified it so this was really cool in the connex paper as well where they like if you haven't you should read connex it's like a very well written paper connex 1 i haven't read 2 it really like shows you how different concepts improve the accuracy and this paper is also somewhat similar to that because it talks about uh how the large language model architecture was created even 65 billion is 100 gb of weights right i start pulling the weights after i saw how big i don't have access to the weights so i'm not sure um yeah i don't know how big the weights are i know this that like uh, many a times they're not perfectly reflective so if you just look at the weights you would make it like things make sense but like with uh, all of the stable diffusion stuff the other hugging face models as well they like try to make it robust to run right so like with especially with stable diffusion you'd have the model which is like 2 gb and then you have like all of this other things that come along with it which is the va and all those things which make it 10 gigs so it might look like it's 10 gb but it's really 2 gb and then when you're inferring uh, using that it takes like 5 gigs in your gpu so it's really not like a one on one mapping and then you also think about model weights in terms of training remember you're thinking of inference here so it's not just that you want to like train a model so will it fit in my memory no that's not the case you're thinking about inference here because it will probably be like super expensive to uh, fine tune a large language model pre training data they talk about the pre training data and they say it's in the table so you can take a look at how they are combining this and how big is the data set i think Im imagenet is about 300 gigs if i am not wrong and you can see how many times did they train the model on it so you can see that this was 0.64 on github which is where i assume the um ability to write code although somewhat inaccurate as dylan suggested comes from you can see that it can probably write about books probably about archive and it was trained for different epochs here now i don't know what's the logic for training to these epochs it might be some intuition it might be they wanted to have some understanding for it most probably it's just like they're looking at the error values and it could be early stopping although for large language models it's not usually the case because these models can keep uh, keep improving after consuming electricity of the size of a village i'm just i'm just being snarky these have real world uh, importance as well although they are expensive to train is what i'm trying to say so they talk about here the pre training data data mixture used for pre training will is the sampling proportion when training on 1.4 trillion tokens and this size the pre training runs on 1 trillion tokens have the sample 
same sampling proportion. Cool. So now I don't want to know about the pre-training data. I'll scroll. I'll scroll past it. They talk about the tokenizer, which we read using the implementation from sentence piece. So it looks like they did not modify it at all. They say that they split the numbers into individual digits and fall back to bytes to decompose unknown UTF-8 characters. Overall, the data set cons consists of 1.4 trillion tokens after tokenization. Let's take a look at the architecture. They leverage various improvements that were pr proposed in Palm paper. If you don't know what this is, uh, most of the time such uh, papers cite them. So it would have ideally the researcher's name here, like so. And if you click on it, it will take you to the name of the paper. People who work in academia can see the names of the paper and recall, oh, cool. yeah, yeah, I know this, like this paper had this technique. I can't. So it might be a good idea to go to that paper and just read its introduction to refresh your memory. Most of the times it's not really important. When is it important? Let's say they, they quote a paper like, so, so I'm just making this up. It, I don't think that's the case here, but let's say they said we are using this activation because it was key in this paper and they showed it in palm paper. So then I would go to palm paper section, which would probably talk about why that was key. And then I would have an understanding. Okay. Now this makes sense because many times people tends to uh, papers tend to cite each other and they leave the explanation to the other paper. So I have to go there and understand it unless you're like actively a researcher in the field and you like have this all in your head, which I don't think many researchers do as well. It's like really hard to do that. So they talk about pre-normalization here. They normalize input of each transformer sublayer instead of normalizing the output. And this came through this paper. So we can see that uh, they used RMS norm function, which was introduced in this paper. If I find RMS norm in PyTorch, I don't care. I don't want to read the paper. If I can't, then I would read the paper and try to implement it. They use swing glue activation, which comes from palm. This is good enough for me. They use rotary embeddings, which I said, I don't know because I didn't read GPT new. We remove the absolute positional embeddings. Okay. This, these few words make sense because you've been going through the book and instead add rotary positional embeddings introduced in this paper at each layer. So this is probably one example where you would have to go through the paper to understand why this is being used. They talk about the ad, uh, Adam optimizer, which is what they ended up using. And here's the training loss versus billions of token. You can see that the red line, which is the 65 billion model is the best as you would expect. And there's significant difference between all of them. Uh, and you can, it's, it's cool to see that the error spikes are also there across some models. Uh, notably the 33 billion, the green line, and you can see that 65 billion also had this really large spike. They talk about efficient implementation next. So this is also uh, interesting to me. I'll probably read this. We use an efficient implementation of multi-head attention to reduce memory usage and runtime. This is available in Xformers, which is one of my favorite libraries for stable diffusion. Install this, your memory usage goes down by 2x, 3x. Like best trick in machine learning right now. Pip install Xformers, use uh, its implementation of attention. Memory usage goes down. And when you're training models at such a large scale, right? So Dylan said 2000 A100s, it's important to like really, really look at this and squeeze out every bit of performance you can. So they talk about how Xformers do it. And next they say to further improve, we reduce the amount of activations that are recomputed during the backward pass with checkpointing. So they are using checkpointing more precisely. They say the activations that are expensive to compute. 
so many times you like benchmark models you reading through the theory and you see these concepts this is expensive or in a classic whiteboard interview it's see oh uh, this is, has like a very high uh, cost you probably want to remove for loops what not it doesn't really make sense for small models but for such models at such scale right it makes a large amount of difference so that's why you really want to optimize it and you're looking at oh we like figured out a way how to efficiently compute that and we don't want to use the expensive computation in the backward pass i don't know what the expensive comp computations in backward pass is if you ask me for a job interview question of uh, writing back prop i would struggle right now but for this case uh, as dilan says it's really interesting they manually implemented the backward pass i see uh, pratik in the chat and it's pratik is a is the nlp guy he is the nlp guy on twitter that's his uh, username and he's one of the nlp experts in the world not just in india he's from india though i don't know what he's doing in my chat but thanks for joining pratik so they say more precisely as dilin said uh, they manually implemented backward function for transformer layers instead of relying on pytorch autoguard would you want to do do this no you wouldn't but for such a large scale it's important pratik is saying no he is nirant he's trolling me for something that happened today i called him uh, nirant because i i didn't look at his name and in my head i thought oh nlp expert it's probably nirant or pratik and i chose nirant randomly i i's doing top k uh, sampling pratik and that was the word that came to my mind fully benefit this from this optimization we need to reduce the memory usage by using model and sequence parallelism which is defined in another paper so if i'm making a large language model i'd go and read it i am not so i'll skip it moreover we also overlap the computation of activations and the communication between gpus over the network so this is cool uh, i i i think i understand it correctly but while the computation is happening there's also a network lag right so if you do a computation and send the data you have to wait for two things like the computational to finish and then whatever latency there is to like send the data and like receive it in different uh computers so they say they also figure out how to reduce that which is uh, which is like it makes sense when you read it and i'm sure they like really spent a lot of time uh, thinking about it he says my my answer makes sense to him so i'm i was honestly man i was worried i i might have upset you so i'm glad you're not upset and you're trolling me back i mentioned earlier in the chat i like barely slept in the last two days which is probably apparent through my face and that's why that happened they say when training 65 billion parameter model our code processes around 380 tokens per second per gpu on 2048 a100 gpus this is not a bad size this is the number of gpus that they had used <laughs> this means that training took about 21 days and this number is not like out of the world although like for an individual uh it doesn't make sense to train for that long right but for a large language model they tend to like take a while to read that or to read that or uh, train for that i was reading the chat where pratik said he want to he wants to read the paper and you can already see my brain is a little hazy right now so they talk about the main results they say zero shot we provide a textual description of the task and text example the model either provides an answer using open ended generation or ranks the proposed answer they talk about few shot we provide a few examples of the task and a test example the model takes this text and generates the answer or ranks different options cool so this makes sense i probably i'm not too keen about how it performs across different uh, benchmarks so i'm i'm again skipping past this they talk about common sense reasoning 
and now this is a point where if you're working on one of these problems you'd like really want to read through the description and see its performance and then evaluate it for today's live stream i don't think uh, for me it's like of key interest and then they talk about instruction fine tuning they show that briefly fine tuning on instructions data rapidly leads to improvements on mmlu now i don't know what mmlu is i was just catching up for the chat mmlus uh i don't know what these are can anyone please point out in the chat i'm new to this term although the non fine tuned version is already able to follow basic instructions you observe a very small amount of fine tuning improves the performance okay so this is another benchmark uh normally when i'm reading through the paper i would like pay close attention to these sections as well and it's cool that all the authors in include now a uh, study of the toxicity bias and misinformation these are mostly straight forward so i would like suggest reading this for the live stream it's not uh, useful to the demonstration they usually talk about the biases the model could have sometimes they show where it's not effective and it's good to know such things instead of simply downloading the model and later finding out thanks dilan it's multitask language understanding i learn something new and i learn everything uh, i learn a new thing and i've learned everything through my live streams these days i learned another new thing from dilan today is what i'm trying to say so we can take a look at the related works as well uh, which doesn't interest me as much and i'll probably spend time reading the conclusion again and this would mark the end of my final pass now if i really want to implement this paper or bring it to a product you would like then really dissect the paper and the sections you are interested in but in general i wanted to showcase how i parse papers and how i go through them so i showed you the multi stage approach in which i parse through papers i hope you enjoyed this i'll give some homework suggest some homework not give it and just catch up on the chat before wrapping up so geeky programmers are saying they have implemented their own chatbot using chat gpt api i will take a look definitely after the live stream thanks for sharing that geeky pro trip if you're trying to train this run this model on <laughs> 4096 so you can train in around 12 days does it work like that though doesn't like like jokes aside since they've accounted for scaling and they like talked about the network latencies i expect it would not be like linear here so you would have some like diminishing returns my guess is and i will test it on the 4100s i have after the live stream but my guess is it will take around like 16 days shooting in the air here i'm just guessing cool so i would say uh, if as an experiment you want to read five papers but understand one so like go in really in depth about it uh, write about what you read i again showed how pastor has been doing it and that's like one of the best ways of understanding it the chat gpt api is really cheap so consider playing with it and consider subscribing for stable diffusion and nlp content we'll meet next week where we'll catch up on the chapters and i'll probably also showcase some kaggle competition re relevant to them so thanks for watching we'll meet again next week at the same time and now i'll go catch catch some sleep